just an intro to the sports topics of engineering. Um, there will be a couple of ones we're going to focus on over the next 30 like, classes. And get a bit of a sense from you as well what you'd like to see in these classes. Okay, so it's, uh, it's an elective, there's a lot of freedom. Uh, you can do, you can pay attention to sports outlines, you can know, notice sports outlines in this year has changed. Um, this course is 31 years old and the outline stayed the same for 30 years and we've had a bunch of census for the very first year. But there's a lot of freedom and the census has been added, has been intentionally added to give us that scope to look into some things that have become more and more prevalent, big data, data mining, data analysis, some of the topics that are now coming up. So let's take a look at what we're going to be focusing on. Um, I don't need to talk about myself, most of you know me. Um, I've been here, I, for many of you have been in my classes enough times that you've seen this slide. Uh, the only thing my privilege is there's a third bullet point that indicates that this course is based on a lot of my own experience with data analysis. Um, in fact, the statistics went through the course, it's the first time I'm teaching it, was the first course I taught here at the university, and was taught, I thought it mainly because um, I, I had this experience in the university needed someone to teach it in a hurry because the uh, person normally teaching it uh, was slept. So I've, I've done it enough times that I'm very comfortable with the material, but I've also had enough background that we've got a lot of freedom to, to do the work. So my goal of the course is to make it practically worthwhile. So I want you to leave here with a set of skills that you can use. And I know that students that have left in the past four years have left with a set of skills that have actually made them pretty noticeable in their companies. Okay, so I've had some emails from students telling me that stuff from this course alone has got them promoted several times over. Uh, so it's definitely got a lot of work on it. I hope you enjoy it. So um, at any time, there's anonymous course evaluations through the course website that you can let me know how I'm doing or any feedback. We'll talk about that as well. Uh, but let's just put it in context, right? This is not, none of this is all my own work. Uh, a lot of this is largely based on the work of John McGregor. John McGregor was the first person who taught the course between back in 1983. Um, so he, he inspired the content to a very, very large extent. I've built on that since then. And the other contribution into the McMaster Advanced Control Consortium, the interaction that I've had with those companies over the years, led to a lot of this. Uh, data analysis as of the recent type, data variables, multivariate data analysis. Um, so we'll have some of those topics in the end. Okay, so first thing I'd like to introduce the TAs. Uh, we have two TAs for this course, two really top-notch TAs. Yannan is over here. Uh, she's doing her PhD with Dr. Schwartz. Many of you have, have seen Yannan in other courses. Uh, she's in JHE 369. <coughs> Shailesh is the other TA in Canada on the 17th of January. He just had some delays. So both TAs are contactable via the email addresses over there. Um, and they really are your first point of contact for any questions. So I'll talk a bit about office hours and our strategy for that in a minute. But um, the way you contact them is by email, set up a time that works for you, works for them. Um, especially here in the fourth year, everyone's program is so different that there isn't a single time that works for office hours. So we've kind of abandoned that over the past four or five years and moved to email you know, and that works a whole lot better. So it saves everyone a little time. Thank you. The other important thing about the course is that it's all online. So everything about this course is online with videos, there's all the notes, all the announcements. Most of you have taken my other courses and you're very comfortable with that website. So the 4 c free website over there is the first place that you go to if you're looking for any information on assignments, <coughs> solutions, and all the data sets that you'll be needing for this course. There's also a whole lot of material on the course website that we'll talk about this afternoon. Now, the other way that you can uh, keep in contact is through the Twitter account over there, Stats for Orange. Um, all the announcements will also
also be tweeted out. So if you don't remember to check the website, at least you will get it uh, through your phone. And that might be worthwhile. So usually um, about one third of the class signs up for the Twitter feed as well. So that's worth considering. Otherwise, my expectation is that you check the website. I will not re-announce the material I post on the website in class. So once I post it on the website and make an announcement on the website, I assume that you put it on. So either subscribe to the Twitter feed or check the website regularly to make sure that you're in contact. Um, this is what the website looks like. So all the announcements are posted over there. Uh, so this is what the website looked like a few hours ago. Uh, you can see all the announcements posted previously and last week today and last week. Um, there's where all the materials were posted. So all those links that are read are not available yet. We're going to they will turn blue in a few days' time and the material <coughs> So of course the PDF has the section begins, so you can print it out and then bring that to class to add your own notes to The seven assignments that we'll be focusing on will be focused on the real solutions and then the calendar as usual on the bottom on the bottom right hand side. So the assignment dates are already posted on, on that calendar, the midterm dates are already posted and the project due dates. So as before, um, the videos are already on the site from previous years. If you want to go look at the past four years of videos and audio, they're available for you. Um, though we probably want this year's videos as they progress. And so I'll post those within a day or two, usually on the course, um, on the class I should say, uh, usually much less than that. So it's a good backup. Most of the people that use the videos use it as a review. They don't use it as a substitute. They use it as a review because I cannot pay attention to my own videos for more than 10 minutes before falling asleep. And I don't expect you to pay attention in class for more than 45 minutes. It's not really possible. Right? So if you need to go back and figure out the part of the course that didn't make sense to you, that you want to have repeated, that's what the video is there. If you choose not to attend classes and just watch the video, that's also fine. But that's uh, your, your prerogative. And I will just add though that the audio quality and video quality is not always the best, right? So it's, it really is there for the users. Now let's talk about the textbook. Um, this course is lucky enough that you don't have a textbook that you need to go buy. For the cost of printing out, so you can get uh, that those set of notes that I've written up. Um, and I keep updating that, that textbook every week or so while the course is in progress based on any feedback. So if you notice any errors or you've got any suggestions, please email me and I make those updates. Uh, you'll see that the first page of the book has an extensive list of uh, acknowledgments from previous students in the course that have made uh, suggestions that are there. So that's available for you to download for free. You can print it out wherever you'd like to print it out. So you know, Parents, Mr. at home, whatever at least, you don't have to do this event yourself. Um, so that's going to be about $20, $30 in printing there at your own cost. But if you do wish to buy some textbooks, this is one that I highly recommend. Statistics for Engineers by Box Hunter and Hunter. So it's only in the second edition. The first edition was around for about 20 years before they updated it to the second edition. So it, it indicated the level of quality that the writers wrote the first edition. And the second edition had some major updates on a few chapters, and the other chapters that were not updated were left exactly as it, there were almost no errors. This book, I cannot stress the value of it. Box, George Box, Stu Hunter um, are two very applied practical statisticians. This is not a theoretical book with graphs of distributions and all sorts of green letters that is unturned. This is very, very practical advice on what works or doesn't work when it comes to statistics. So it's a recommended book. If you want wanting to spend however much it is, I think it's just around hundred dollars, it's well worth it. So it's a strong recommendation. It's not in the bookstore because it's only recommended. Um, but it is online um, and secondhand fairly, fairly cheap. So I do recommend that. And maybe not even now, but after you graduate and start earning some money, it's worth, really worthwhile considering. 
Uh, then there's about six or seven other references posted on the course website. Various traditional statistics textbooks for engineers, but none of them are really worth the buy, in my opinion. Because they're, uh, they're good as references if you want some technical background, but that part of the is really excellent. My notes up there are largely based on this book, or their book, and um, some other experience that I've had. So it's, you can get a bit of, you can certainly get by 100% in this course with just the slides and, and my key Any questions on that? Let's take a look then at some ways that you can give me feedback. You can either give me feedback in person, by email, or if you prefer anonymously, you can fill out this form on, the, on, the, on that website. There's the URL. Um, and email and click submit, and it will send your message to me anonymously. And I like that because I get a chance to improve the course and not wait for course evaluations. Right? So I still haven't received the evaluations from last term's course. So this is a way that I can make improvements right now so that you guys get that. Any problems, any technical issues you're experiencing, let me know right away and I can try to make it better. <coughs> like one problem I already know that will exist with this class is the lack of a blackboard or this very small blackboard over here. So, so there will be times where we work through problems on that tiny board and it will get a little bit messy, but that's what NDCL is, right? There's no other option. Uh, other classes have postage stamp screen and a large blackboard, this is the opposite. So that's one issue I know is going to come, but I can't do much about it. But if there's other issues that you're experiencing, let me know about it, I can see what I can do. Now we will use software, we will use R, and you will experience R and probably in a very terrible negative light in the stats course, right? So in your second year or third year, stats prerequisite that you've taken, you may have, or you did use R, right? Did you use R? Yeah. No, no. Some of you used Minitab. No, no. Okay. So some of you have used Minitab, some of you have used R. You can continue to use Minitab, or you can use R. I have no preference. Um, how many of you use, have used Python? Okay. So Python has excellent statistical libraries, and if you choose to use those, that's also a, a great, great option. Minitab, if you have experience with that, absolutely feel free to use it. I, it's, I'm software agnostic, I'm more about the results. But if you're comfortable with one of those packages up there or some other package that's not listed over there, feel free to use it. And that's what you submit, right? The course is not checking your R code or your MATLAB code or in Minitab there is no code. You can point it and click to and gone through a process to get a result. What you're interested in is the results and your interpretation of the results. That's far more important um, to, to us in this course. Now, if you choose to use R, there's a complete tutorial on the course website for it. It's broken down into 26 modules, going all the way from just downloading and installing it, to printing basic plots, to loading data sets, <coughs> to linear regression. So it builds up over several steps. And the reason why we like to use R is it's widely recognized. So pretty much every company I've worked with, they either use R or they know of it. And they endorse the use of it in their company. And the one major reason is because it's free and because they recognize its top-notch statistical accuracy. So R is an open source package and it's written by widely respected statisticians. So many companies will use it or allow you to I've never encountered a company where they said, no, you cannot use R okay, to their employees or the interaction with people. So R is a great language to learn. Uh, it runs on a number of platforms. There's a great number of libraries. The equivalent of that would be like MATLAB toolboxes. Right, so you can download additional libraries that will extend the functionality of R to pretty much any sort of statistical area that you're interested in. Um, and the other reason why it's good is because it promotes good self-documenting code. Right? If you've written an R file, you've got full traceability from the point where you load the data set all the way to generating the results. 
something like mini tab, you don't get that. Mini tab, you click, 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 but there's no recollection two weeks later of where you clicked to generate the plot. Okay, unless you kept track of it in some sort of macro. But R, by definition, you've written that code and it will keep track of that for you. So it's, it promotes very good statistical practice in that sense. Well, not even a statistical practice, that's good engineering practice of being able to trace your steps back, being able to audit every single step you take. Okay, so if you're interested in learning R, if you haven't learned it yet, um, please go through that self-directed tutorial on the website. It's, uh, the link is right on the home page of the software. So uh, just to point out where it is, if you're looking for it, the software tutorial is over there. Self-paced software tutorial. Yeah, and then this is just a snapshot of a New York Times article talking about the statistical language and the authors of it. So we will look at that later on. Okay, so it is about the office hours. I've covered this essentially. The TAs are your first point of contact, and I'm also available. The best way to get all of these is to go look at that link over there. My full calendar is posted. You can see when I'm available. And then send me an email to make an appointment in the time when I'm free. So all my busy and available slots are shown on that calendar. And I'm more than happy to meet you in person if you cannot uh, meet the teachers. OK, so I will talk about this all this text in a graphical manner next, so we'll skip over that for now. Let's just take a look and step back a second and understand why this course is necessary. If it was necessary back in the 80s, it's probably and arguably even more necessary now, given the wide variety of data that we're surrounded by. So we're surrounded by many basic data sets, right? So we're comfortable as engineers with temperature, pressures, flow rates. We've seen those in many of our courses. We don't need to recount those. Lab samples, you've all seen. You collect a small amount of data and you write up your lab report for 3L or 4L, and you've done linear regression in those, in those labs. Um, if you've done a co-op, you may or may not have experienced what's called a data historian. Data historian is simply a piece of computer software that will automatically keep track of all these data. So all these data measured on the process you can have a data historian set up to automatically archive and collect that data for you at whatever sampling frequency you like. Once per second, five times per second, once per hour, whatever your choice is. And so you can collect a large body of data and guaranteed, if you work in the medical industry, you'll work with one of the main historians, like Pi um, is another one, Aspen. Uh, Aspen has a data historian. There's many of them around. Image data is another interesting form of information that you work with. Batch process data we'll talk about at some point. Uh, spectral data, so if you've done a chemistry lab where you've got a UV spectrometer or an NIR spectrometer, you, you get that whole wavelength profile. There's, a, there's data at every wavelength. Acoustic measurements are really interesting. About 10 years ago, they became really prevalent. Um, and companies started to use acoustic sensors where you get a small device and you put it on a solid object and pick up all the vibrational information that's traveling through that object. So it's been used for a variety of, of sources and reasons. For example, BMW uses it to design their cars so that the vibrations from the engine doesn't impact the interior of the car. So they engineered the, the car so that it's relatively silent on the interior. Um, I've used that sort of acoustic information with uh, projects where we put them on knees and joints on your finger and we can pick up arthritis just by moving your knee or your finger. We can pick up all the vibrations that your bones make as they grind against each other and you can tell what the nature of that bone is inside it. So acoustic measurements are really, really interesting and therefore uh, the new subset of data that we started to see in industry. So companies now will put acoustic sensors on pipes to measure flow and listen to what's going on in their process and make inference on if the process is operating well. 
Then you're comfortable these days with GPS, latitude and longitude data. We're very comfortable pulling out a phone and looking where we are on the map. That's information that's useful. If you've ever gone to the ER or just even to the dentist and you've had um, a dental scan done or a more sophisticated medical imaging, MRI or ECG, that's a form of useful information. And now what's becoming the new goal in the medical industry is combining those sources of data to make a diagnosis. So pulling those data in and making a medical diagnosis is really, really interesting. We won't get to cover that in this course, but the basic concepts we learn here if any of you go into the medical industry in the future, we'll be able to apply what we learn here in those in that area. And then finally, on the transactional data, every single time you go to the grocery store and you swipe your debit card and credit card, it's not just paying for the goods that you're buying. Also, it's recorded is your name, your address, likely might be transferred to the person that you're buying the material from. Um, what you're buying is often transferred as well. And companies build up a whole profile about you, and especially if you're using a loyalty card, your Air Miles card. So the data that you give freely available out to other companies is then used, and then that's used to target you in some way. Right? So you make a mailing, Few months later, that based on your profile and your gender and your location where you live, you might be a suitable target for some marketing campaign. So transactional data now is, is a very, very large data set. You can imagine every transaction that happens in a grocery store every day, that's many, many rows. So that's megabytes to gigabytes of data. Chemical plants data, if you collect data once per second on just a thousand measurements, you're collecting data in the gigabyte range. So we're faced with a lot of quantities of data. So here was one email I received the first time I took the course, and it was in the class. Uh, this was back in 2010. And he said he's been going back over his course, he knows all the time, and on a daily basis he has to look at a large amount of data and try to make sense of it. Uh, and then his comment next was, I think what I learned most about the course was emphasis on thinking in the process of getting to a solution. So how, how to deal with that large quantity of data. Tiffany was another student two years later. She went to Mexico and she did a number of interesting design experiments, um, which she got a lot of recognition for. And then a year later, she, she phoned me up on Friday and we had a conversation on the phone and was just talking through about how to visualize a big data set that she was dealing with. And then made the presentation on Monday and phoned me back on Tuesday to say thanks. Because what she had done then, we had worked our way through that discussion, was a very good visualization of the data to try and convey the things to the managers. And, and every single one of these instances, and a few other cases that we haven't quoted yet, students have come back and said how these tools have helped them to convince their employers, to convince their colleagues of some sort of data analysis. Okay, so we're going to look at that, actually the very first class coming up after this one on Wednesday is data visualization. How to understand and how to suitably visualize data sets. That's one of our first topics we're going to cover. Then we're going to start looking into some other statistical. So before I go on, I'll give you two, three minutes. What I'd like you to do is, on a piece of paper, write out one or two topics that are interesting to you that you think might be useful in this course. Right? What is a statistical tool that you don't understand or you might have heard about? Maybe if even just simply linear regression, you really don't actually understand linear regression. Or maybe it's some other statistical concept that you've heard of that you haven't tried out yet that you think might be interesting to learn about in this course. Okay, so take a minute or two and write that on a piece of paper, any scrap of paper.
really make that distinction. And most of you are comfortable with correlation versus causality, but you'll just emphasize that in that section. Then the major chunk of this course is actually on this topic of design experiments. Now, I'd like to be counterintuitive that of course the statistics focuses so much on DOE. But here's one thing. If you can do design experiments well, you have a leg up on every other engineer in Canada. No other university teaches this to the extent that they teach it. And the economics the importance of well-designed set of experiments cannot be overstated. So I'll talk about why we need to do design experiments really effectively. And we'll learn how to do it. And in fact, you'll do your own set of experiments in a course project. So that course project outline is already posted on the website. I strongly recommend you download it and read it through this week. Even though it's only due at the end of March, you're going to be running a set of experiments and you may need about four or five weeks to actually do your experiments. So you may need that extra time. It's not possible to do data, uh, data acquisition and write up your report all at the end. And especially in this course where you've got this time at the beginning, you should be doing that. So a number of really interesting course projects have been done over the past four, four years or so. I posted a few of those on the website to give you some ideas. But that's really powerful. But most of the students in this course have said they learned the most by doing that project. Because you actually go and realize what it is to do experiments. Okay. And the reason why that's so important is because in a company, your boss guarantee will almost never allow you to do experiments. Because when you do experiments, you're disrupting the process. And you're losing money for the company. So you have to, when you're doing those experiments, do them in such a way that you cause minimal disruption, but get the most information. So that means you need to do the fewest number of experiments to get the most information. And I'll show you how to do that. So the way you can do that effectively is by trying it yourself at home where that disruption that you cause isn't catastrophic. Okay. Many of the course projects involve making drinks, making popcorn, baking stuff, growing plants. Like you can do a variety of experiments. Um, and so these don't cost you a lot of money at the time. But when you work in a company, you can then apply what you learned from the project on, on a real plant. So we'll spend about four to five weeks on this topic, maybe even a little bit more. And then I've moved process monitoring to the end. Process monitoring is simply uh, a way that we can track our process to make sure it's operating stable and in a reliable manner. So we'll look at some of these concepts of PWMAs. How many of you have taken a business course? Have you seen PWMAs? Yeah, so you guys are comfortable with PWMAs. The rest of the class, that's a really strong um, Okay, how many of you have heard of Six Sigma? Okay, this is Six Sigma. But we don't use that jargon in Six Sigma, right? What we're going to look at it is from a statistical point of view to so actually understand what Six Sigma is about. When you go into a company and they talk about Six Sigma this, Six Sigma that, it can get very confusing. And really all that it comes down to is just good statistical practice. So that's why I'm putting this at the end. We would spend some time and actually sort through some of those concepts so that when you leave here and do an encounter of black belts and green belts and six sigma people, <coughs> you know what they're talking about. So, this is an important topic here again. And then finally, we'll have some time to look at latent variable methods where um, we apply some of this newer statistical thinking to large data sets. Okay, so let's. Uh, just talk a bit about grading. Um, you all, any of you that have taken my previous courses have seen this before, where our focus is understanding right, and being able to interpret our results. It's not about getting that number. I don't really care what you get as your hypothesis test or your confidence interval your value or your linear regression, um, slope and intercept. What I'm far more concerned about is what your interpretation of that is, that you interpret correctly. So you will need to apply that thinking to new instances, and those new instances may not be chemical engineering. How many of you in this class are not chemical engineers? 
there's usually at least 10, 15 non-chemical engineers in this class. And so we have to be able to apply the tools we learn here, they don't just apply to chemical processes, they apply to non-chemical processes, they apply to world events, they apply to medical data, they apply to public policy, bioengineering are a few areas where data come up all the time. And so many of the examples I use in the exams and midterm are non-chemical engineering. Almost always they're non-chemical engineering. Because what you can apply to non-chemical engineering data, you can apply to chemical. Now, the grading is a little bit different to previous years. There's 30% of group work broken up across assignments and projects. So assignments and projects you can do in groups of two, or you can do it by yourself. You don't have to do it in a group of two. It's entirely self-selected. If there's anyone here doing the master's, the accelerated master's program, in other words, you're taking this course not at 400 level, <coughs> level, but you're still an undergraduate, but you're accelerating your master's program, you need to let me know right away so that you do the 63 assignments. Undergrad students in the course of three stream that do the 600 level questions will get extra credit for it to, to a certain extent. So sometimes uh, where indicated, if you do the 600 level questions, you'll get extra credit for it, but not always. And 63 students will have extra questions, extra readings, and your, your standard of um, your quality of work at a higher level. Okay, so, so that's just to be aware of those. Okay, there's some late day hand in. Uh, uh, so two day late day credits are available. So one assignment handed in two days late, so two assignments could be handed in one day late. Uh, there's no makeups for them. The science count 20% of the course grade. I'll drop the lowest grade that you get. So if you miss an assignment or you do poorly on one assignment, that grade disappears. And I'll take the best A minus one assignments to put it to a percent. Okay, assignment dates are posted on the website. We have many assignments at the beginning and then far fewer at the end. So I make use of this time at the beginning of the semester we put relatively low. So the, the, we can read through this later on, but the main message here is it's no good doing an assignment where you share the work. So one person does two or three questions and the other person does the rest of the questions. That's no good. You're defeating the object of that group-based assignment. You should be working together and collaborating on all the questions and not just your portion. So don't divide up the assignment. But you will be dividing up the assignment, I know that. But I'm just putting it out here that you shouldn't be doing that. Now, there's also weekly tests. So as I was saying to my third year class this morning, weekly tests, and many of you have seen them before, are a way for you to pace yourself. So any of you who've taken the psychology course with Joe Kim in the first year? Yeah. So several of you have experienced Joe Kim's weekly test. Same idea here. Uh, if you read things in purple, I'll link to a um, website that's all about the testing effect and the spacing effect. These are two different psychological terms um, that are related to the learning literature. And there's good evidence to show that the testing effect and the spacing effect is in your favor. One way you can see it is if you're training for any event, so if you're going to run the Boston Marathon, or you're going to take your G2 driving test, or you're doing some gymnastics, or ballet, or some sporting activity. You do not go and practice the day before to write that exam the next day, or do the performance the next day. So no sports player sits at home and then two, three days before the sporting event goes out and practices and then performs. Right? They're, they're practicing all the time on a paced manner, a spaced manner, and that's exactly what that space and effect is referring to. So we're going to have these weekly tests as a way for you to stay up to date with the work and for you to try out um, statistical problems on a space to basis. So that will be posted on Monday nights and you have a Wednesday to do it. So it's about 40 hours. And during that 40 hours, you can find one hour to go sign into the website and do that. 
I will come to the work just recovered in class. The solutions will be given after the testing window closes, and each test will be about 1% of the grade. So if you use any material when you do this online test, you're absolutely free to consult any websites, any electronic documents. Just do not collaborate with other people. So it's a code of honor that you're doing this test on your own. But being a computerized system, you can be sure that there's some tracking in there to be sure that that's actually happening. So that's 13% of your course grade. There's the other component, there's a midterm that's 12%, and it's entirely optional. If you do not write the midterm, it moves over to the final exam. Though, again, from prior experience in this course, people skipping out on the midterm do very poorly on the final exam. So it's in your favor to write the midterm. It also means that your stakes are much lower or more spread out, I should say. The final exam is 45% of your grade, and you have to achieve a grade of 50% or more in that final exam to pass the course. If you achieve lower than in the final exam, you will not pass the course. Um, and with the final and midterm, you can have anything, any notes, any textbooks, any references that you write, any calculator. <coughs> then let's just talk about the project. It's due at the 31st of March. You perform your own set of experiments. You need to provide evidence that you've done those experiments yourself in the project, whether it's photographic or otherwise. And you can go look at that on the course website where the details are posted. And what I do strongly suggest, you don't have to do this, but I strongly suggest is that by the 10th of March or even earlier, you, you email me a draft outline of your intended experiments so that I can give you some guidance. So this is where most students have benefited from these courses, from that feedback to kind of put them in the right path. Make sure you're doing the experiments wrong. So actually that 10th of March date is too late. I would strongly su suggest that already by the 1st of March you can you know, some proposal or project plans. So you can do this in groups of two again, or by yourself, and 600 level students are doing this by themselves. And then finally, here are the dates for the midterm 13th of February, the Thursday evening. Be a midterm. Okay, so is Wednesday okay? Okay, so let's move it to 12th of February. So 12th of February then is going to be the midterm. If that's not a good date, I need to know right away. Yes. Four A or three A. On Tuesday. Okay. Do you have anything on Tuesdays? Okay, so then it's Wednesday. Okay, I can't, there's, there's only Friday, but I can make it Friday the 14th, which I don't think anyone wants. No. So, Wednesday is the date. How many people cannot make it? Okay, so it's a very small number of people relatively to the rest of the class. That's the problem with the final year elective, is we cannot accommodate everyone. So either you choose not to write it as optional, or you choose to uh, miss out on another course. Okay, so 12th of February, then on Wednesday night, we need to Okay, any questions about the course at this point? Questions about the textbook, about the notes, about the website, about the project? Okay, so next Wednesday's class will talk about data visualization. On your way out, make sure you please hand in that piece of paper with your suggestions for this.